Do you remember that video I made about the RC-51, aka the Ducati killer? The whole premise of that video was essentially a look at Ducati's persistence in their strong sense of heritage. I mean, what do you, what do you associate Ducati with? Other than a overdrawn bank account and skipped lunches. A Desmodromic 90 degree V-twin, otherwise known as an L-twin. Their adherence to the L-twin engine in the racing world was so strong that a compromise had to be made in world superbike racing to make them competitive in the sea of four cylinder engines. The issue is that the compromise which allowed twin cylinder engines to run up to 250 more cc over the four cylinders it worked a little bit too much in their favor but you can watch this video if you want to learn more about that well anyway that was all during the 90s and the early 2000s but in the present day technology and experience has eclipsed raw displacement so even with the new displacement rules that they demanded in world superbike for 2008 that allowed for 1200 cc twin engines to compete with 1000 cc fours ducati had begun struggling to stay competitive the background of this 2008 change is that they made an ultimatum to the fim that if the uh, you know this displacement advantage wasn't put in place they would quit wsbk and so it was spawning bikes like the 1198 and the 1199 Panigale. Terrific bikes, but again, the last 10 years has seen some of the most complex and advanced leader bikes come out, and these days you could comfortably run a 1200cc twin against a 1000cc4. Despite Ducati's persistence with the V-twin engine, they only took the 2008 and the 2011 championships with the uh, 1098, and they never even took a single one with their full 1200cc Panigale. The writing was on the wall. It was clear that four cylinders were officially the way to go. Of course, that was probably always the case, but again, those displacement rules. In any case, Ducati shocked the world by dropping a V4 engine into its flagship bike in 2018 to remain competitive in WSBK. See, they were running a V4 in MotoGP for the longest, yes, but this, this was different. This was a clear-cut back down from Ducati of all people. They had fought to keep the V-Twin as competitive as they could, but they ultimately abandoned it for a four-cylinder. I mean, think about that. A company renowned for its specific racing heritage had to put that all aside, and it definitely wasn't without a heavy heart either. So they dropped the Panigale V4, but under a few conditions. It must feel like a twin, it must fire like a twin, it must sound like a twin, it's got to maintain the packaging benefits of a twin, and in a specific fashion, it must use a Desmodromic valve train that they're known for. Hell, they couldn't even entirely double down on the V4 and simply kill off the V-Twin for their, uh, their flagship model lineup. Instead, they released the Panigale V2. <laughs> to please the purists and likely to help them sleep at night. By the way, the V4R is the homologation special for WSBK, because remember, 4 is limited to 1000cc, and the 1100cc V4 Panigales are just road bikes, and I explain all of that in this video. The Panigale V4 is quite competitive, but it still couldn't end that 6 year tear that Jonathan Ray is on with his Kawasaki ZX-10R, so <laughs> there's that. Now I was only just getting used to the fact that Ducati uh, ditched the V-Twin. You know, and then I recently learned that they sort of also ditched the Desmodromic valve train too, so you can imagine the confused screaming noises that left my face. Now, as with the news of the Rebel, I was also pretty late with learning this, so by that point I was uh, screaming alone, likely confusing my neighbors more than when I loudly repeat the same sentences over and over trying to voice a video. And the thing is, these news articles that announced this new non-Desmodromic engine all have the same clickbaitiness that makes it seem like they ditched the Desmo valves on their flagship bike. No, no, it's just a new multi strata and we'll get back to that, but first a little bit of history on the Desmodromic valve trains and how they relate to traditional spring-based valve systems. Overhead valve engines have pretty much entirely replaced side valve engines, and they're likely going to be what you think of when you think of an engine in general. Valves on top, sitting over the head, springs and retainers on them, but not to be confused with overhead cam engines in which the camshaft is also over the head with the valves. For example, big old American V8 engines have overhead valves but not overhead cams and instead use push rods being acted on by a camshaft firmly tucked below inside the block. Push rod or other non-overhead cam engines have the drawback of adding more elasticity and points of contact which can draw away from the main goal, the actuation of the valves. So you have a cam lobe acting on a lifter which acts on a push rod which acts on a rocker arm which finally acts on the spring and valve assembly. Overhead cam setups allow for the most direct path between the cams and the valves among other benefits. So, by the 1950s, Ducati was mostly concerned with racing and surpassing the limits of their engines. Going from side valves to overhead valves, adopting bevel-driven overhead cams. You know, they weren't too tied down with any one idea, and in order to keep the lights on, they were fast on their feet, but not quite yet at the track, more so with ideas. 
By this point, they would uh, mostly build in small singles for transportation, but they began to take a serious look at racing. A talented engineer by the name of Fabio Taglioni was bought to help kickstart Ducati's racing history, which would also help boost sales for the company. The 98cc 1955 Mariana Sport was Ducati's first overhead camshaft packing racing single. Designed by Mr. Taglioni, the bike served as uh, his debut as Ducati's chief engineer. So how did it go? Well, the Mariana immediately won his first race and continued to dominate throughout his life. See, what wins at the track will sell in the showrooms, and Ducati was able to build a large and passionate fan base, gain attention of the world, and sell way more bikes as a result. Needless to say, they were hooked. But even with that said, Tackley only knew he knew he could do better. After, first and foremost, helping keep Ducati Mechanica, well, existent, Taglioni was ready to start experimenting. See, the elephant in the room was the issue of valve float and plain old valve spring failure. Simply put, the metallurgy of the time was honestly pretty crap. Think uh, of the absolute beating that valve springs take in an engine spinning at high RPMs. Metal compounds were limited at the time and had impurities that made the valve springs susceptible to straight up breaking. These compounds and techniques were good enough, but they started to show issues once little engines started revving higher and higher and higher. So look, it's 1955, and in order to achieve high power at high RPMs, you run lighter valve springs. And these could keep up with the more rigid internals of the engine, but since they're lighter springs of, uh, of poor quality, they're more likely to break under heavy stress or high RPM and catastrophically fail the engine. Okay, so you decide to run heavier, stronger springs. Now that works, but now your engine has to work harder to open the valves and it's slower to close and heavier springs will not only be less able to achieve high RPMs, but they are more likely to cause valve float if you decide to push them anyway. The valve float is the condition that occurs at high RPM when the springs can't close the valves fast enough to keep um, consistent pressure on the valve through any given phase of combustion. Think of it like this, so you're pushing an old engine without a rev limiter to 12,000 RPM. The cam load will push down on the spring open the valve and by the time that lobe returns back to the point where it would normally open the valve it's the valve is still open from the last rotation essentially the spring is not quick enough to close the valve in that nanosecond so if you look at it in slow motion the valve will appear to literally be floating open push it harder and <laughs> your valves might end up kissing your pistons and that's a good way to blow an engine so you have to make the super hard choice blow your engine or blow your engine but taglioni <laughs> theorized that desmodromic valve actuation could actually expand those options out a little bit, you know? Now, you saw desmodromic valves on some Formula 1 Mercedes-Benz engines and a few Nortons, but nothing really in mass or in production vehicles. So Taglioni and his team started building these uh, engines with cam-driven exhaust valves. In early experiments, they discovered that in addition to higher, higher achievable RPM, there was also an increased efficiency of airflow as well as higher torque at lower engine revs. The irony of the desmodromic system was the fact that the highly efficient intake and exhaust flow limited the blow-by of unused fuel into the atmosphere, so you kind of had some emissions-friendly characteristics in an engine designed purely for performance. So here's a quick explanation of the Desmo setup. You get a second rocker arm that is dedicated to closing the valve in question. This means that regardless of engine RPM, the chance for any valve float is eliminated completely. Normally there's a bit of faith involved with a spring set. By using a fixed arm to not only open but also close the valve, you gain the ability to unlock higher RPM levels. In Taglioni's own words, the main goal of this system is forcing a valve to follow the timing diagram as closely as possible, while the dissipated energy save is almost negligible. Performance is more reliable, and the operating safety is definitely enhanced. These engines were much more complex and uh, expensive to produce, but the returns were definitely there. It used a super complex but early version of Desmo valves that had a third bevel-driven camshaft over the head, so this thing had three camshafts. Ducati also made a twin cylinder with the same technology, and they started to become the racing beast that we know them as, but the original Desmodromic tech that used three camshafts was still way too expensive, complex, and excessive for any road-going bikes. Still, Taglioni was motivated to bring Desmodromic valves to Ducati's road bikes, which was hugely expanded beyond the 125 singles at this point. So Taglioni developed a standard uh, single overhead cam single cylinder engine uh, for his growing line of 125s, 160s, 175s, 200, 250s, and 350 cc machines, which included Torrin Scrambler and uh, Sport models. Taglioni's 1950s Desmo racing engines had used complex double and triple overhead cams driven by bevel gears. These systems enabled the little engines to rev to 14,000 RPM, but they were both too costly and far too complex and inappropriate for use on any street bike. Taglioni needed a simpler and more cost-effective design. 
and thus Taglioni came up with this ingenious Desmo system that could be integrated into his basic single overhead cam design with minimal changes. It incorporated two rockers, one upper and one lower for each respective valve. The upper rocker pressed against the end of the valve to push it open. The lower rocker had a split opening at the end, forming two fingers between which the valve stem traveled. The Desmo valve design incorporated a metal ring which the closing rocker lifted, pushing the valve towards its seated or closed position. In 1967, after eight years of development, Ducati introduced its first production Desmodromic engine and placed it into the Mark 3D. On March 20th, 1970, Mr. Taglioni made the first sketches for the layout of the new Ducati V20. By April, his designs were completed and by July, they had a running example of what would become their iconic 90 degree L twin, first being donned by the 500 and the 750 GT bikes by 1971. In all sorts of manner of tune or configuration, this uh, particular configuration has been the staple engine of Ducati ever since. But that's slowly changing throughout Ducati's product line with the aforementioned flagship sport bikes being V4s and finally with the adventure bike segment using non desmodromic valve trains. And the thing is, both changes are rooted in the idea that the respective specific engine specifications are not quite good enough for the respective use cases. To understand why the Multistrada no longer uses desmodromic valves, you must understand the drawbacks of such a valve train. I made sure to specify the shortcomings of the metallurgy in the 1950s because it's not a problem that exists anymore. We're really good at making metal these days, and the average engine you find in a modern 600 can, red, can rev beyond 16,000 RPM. And that comes down to the fact that valve springs are better than ever, because metal, metal work is better than ever. Ducati still uses desmodromic valve trains because they're proud of it, and they deserve to be. I mean, they indirectly made Ducati one of the greatest manufacturers in the world, but the reality is they're no longer necessary because the biggest benefit that they brought has been ironed out as a whole. They tend to produce more power at the low end, which is a plus, yeah, but the desmodromic valve system is also very complex and it, you know things tend to go out of spec. The fact that you have twice as much things to adjust because you have twice as many rockers and clearances and all that stuff because each valve has twice as many of everything. But with the rockers also closing the valves. Now this is why Ducatis have notoriously short valve service intervals. I mean, there's a lot going on up there and you have to keep an eye on it. For example, even with 20 valves, my 2006 FZ1 has 26,000 mile intervals for valves and I'm pretty sure that's not even, I'm pretty sure that's just for inspection. That's not even necessarily adjustment depending on how you treat the bike. A 2006 Ducati 1098 needs valve attention every 7,500 miles. Granted, a newer Panigale can see 15,000 miles before it needs attention, but you can definitely see that there's an issue here. The adventure bike segment is basically the antithesis of the world dedicated to manicured racetracks. You want power down low, not high. You want compliant suspension, not stiff assertive shocks. You want to go far for hours, days, not fast for three minutes at a time. Quite frankly, the Desmo setup is not very conducive to an adventure bike with its shorter service intervals and straight up more complex servicing. I reckon that's pretty plain to see, but it was pretty jarring to see Ducati admit that. It's a big deal, but I have nothing but respect for Ducati's willingness to adapt where they see fit. Other brands who I won't mention definitely show how hard it is to move away from tradition and sometimes when they do finally move away, they just kind of half-ass it or they don't commit to it. In the case where Ducati decided to ditch the Desmo system and use conventional valve springs for the sake of service intervals, they also decided to be the best in the segment in that regard too. The 2021 Multistrada V4 can go 37,000 miles without a valve check and it's like Ducati had a chip on their shoulder and I respect that so much. Ducati definitely puts their soul into everything and I love it. You know, I hate attaching soul to bikes, quote unquote, but it's definitely there. The performance still pretty much jives with the rest of the V4 bikes at a deliberate 170 horsepower, which is more than enough for an adventure bike. If you can't tell by now, this video isn't even directly about the 2021 Multistrada itself, more so about the implications of it. I mean, we covered the past and other bikes more than the bike with the conventional, uh, the conventional valve system itself, because if I love anything, it's a roundabout and historical way to make a point. So. In closing, if Ducati is willing to ditch first the V-Twin and second Desmo valves, what else would they be willing to do? Maybe ditch the uh, 90 degree angle or V-engines in general? Can you imagine? <laughs> what a world. Kudos to them for not trapping themselves in a box. Now, I'm not an adventure guy, but I hope the Multistrada does well. I hope Ducati isn't reeling too hard from the decision, and I hope you all agree that this is a big deal. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.